wow, rocket science. <laughs> and now, you know, now the Atlantic or whatever, New York Times, no offense, wants to be like, well, now here we are. Like, we can't believe. I'm like, no, we were telling you. We were telling you, but you called us granny killers. You called us fascists. You called us eugenicists. You called us white supremacists. You 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 censored us from YouTube and Twitter and all these other outlets. You didn't want to hear what we had to say. And now, three years later, you're coming back and you're saying, well, we didn't know and we were scared. I was scared and I figured it out. Why couldn't you? Hello, everybody. Glenn Lowry here. You are seeing me at this moment because I'm currently recovering from back surgery. I'm not able to record new episodes just now and won't be for a while. I have recorded some episodes in advance, so we'll be able to post content afresh every week at The Glenn Show. Every other week, as you know, John McWhorter and I talk. And John McWhorter will continue to appear every other week. In fact, today, John is going to be filling in for me, hosting The Glenn Show, if you like, The Glenn and John Show. I sure am looking forward to seeing what he does with the opportunity. I will be back just as soon as I can. But in the meantime, and forgive me for this, I want to remind you that my book, Late Admissions, Confessions of a Black Conservative, is available for pre-order at all major bookstores right now. The book's publication date, May 14. But you can order the book now, and I sure hope you do. This is an extremely important piece of work that I've produced in this book. Important to me, and I hope it will be important to you. It gives a full accounting of my life, a long, rich, and complex life of my successes and failures, of my professional accomplishments, my personal peccadillos, my spiritual explorations. I try to take my own measure in this book. I I try to get beneath the cover story that I have been telling myself, the cover stories about this or that escapade, and to pull back the covers. And in doing so, learn about myself, but also expose myself. Those who have looked at it, some of the reviewers say that it's an extraordinarily candid reflection on my life, and I believe that it is. It also is an opportunity for a reader to learn about my ideas, about the genesis of my doctoral dissertation, about my period as a Reagan conservative public intellectual in the 1980s, as a man of the left in the late 1990s and early aughts, and as a anti, anti-racism terror in our current time. No, don't take that anti-anti too seriously. But I do think some of these anti-racists have got their heads well placed up their rear ends, and I don't mind saying so. But in any case, so I've wandered around, my thought has changed. And that's reflected in the book. The story of late admissions encompasses my attempts to transcend my shortcomings and to find peace with myself and peace with the world. So I hope you take a look at it. Book comes out May 14, but you will help me a great deal if you pre-order it now using one of the links in the description. Thanks a lot. So here's John McWhorter, guest hosting The Glenn Show. Hello, all. Welcome to The Glenn Show. I am John McWhorter, and I am guest hosting for Glenn Lowry while he is unhappily on the mend. And what we're going to do today is we're going to pretend that it's Glenn and me, except it isn't, because it's me and Clifton Duncan. And we're going to have a conversation about some crucial issues. Clifton Duncan is an actor. Clifton Duncan is a podcaster. Clifton Duncan is an experienced performer who has had a stage career over much of the United States, including here in New York City. And Clifton Duncan is someone who finds himself out of step with certain received opinions and would like to talk about these things with us. I was particularly interested in Clifton at this point because he is planning a one-man show 
about none other than Tom Sowell, who is, of course, a hero of Glenn's and a hero of mine, very much a North Star. And Clifton, I wanted to ask you as we open, um, why Sowell and why theater as a medium for it? Um, Well, it's been an idea that I've had for a few years now. And, um, you know, like back in 1977, uh, James Earl Jones did a play called Robeson, which is about the great uh, Paul Robeson. Um, about 10 years ago, Larry Fishburne did a play called Thurgood, which is about um, Thurgood Marshall, another one man show. And around the same time, you might you might have seen this show, John, but um, a wonderful actor named John Douglas Thompson did a play called Satchmo at the Waldorf off Broadway about Louis Armstrong. He's an amazing man show. I didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, John is a great, great actor, great guy. And, um, you know, I just said to myself, what could be a one-man show that uh, that I might be able to create and perform myself? And um, I discovered Tom Sowell on a YouTube rabbit hole many, many years ago. And I was like, who is this man with this, uh, you this chocolate skin, these glasses, and the most perfect <laughs> afro you've ever seen? Always. Just completely, yeah. always. Just, you know, the <laughs> lion's mane. Just completely, um, just clinically, calmly, acerbically, wryly um, taking on these, what you called received opinions uh, very effectively. I mean, I sent him, I sent them uh, a clip of him on the, uh, I sent a clip of the, of him on the Bill Buckley show to my progressive friend. And he was like, I find Soul's arguments to be very compelling. Um, but even beyond the stature that he's gained, uh, especially in conservative leaning circles, I just think that he is a fascinating person who's lived a fascinating life. This is someone who was born in 1930. Um, he's experienced segregation and Jim Crow, but he's also experienced progressive racism. And uh, he's also someone who for the first 30 years of his life uh, thought, thought of the world in one way and was I'll say forced in a way to change his opinion when he encountered um, new evidence to challenge those assertions. Um, he's also someone that I'm discovering is sort of a, a man against the machine. There's a common theme in his life that if you read his memoirs, this comes to the fore, where he's someone who has always been at odds, whether it's public schooling when he was a child, to him being in the Marines uh, as a young adult, to him being in academia as, a, as an older adult. He's always been someone who has been very uncompromising, someone who's, who always stood for excellence, strove for excellence, and made sure that he held everyone else to as high a standard as he held himself. Um, there's something, I just think he's a really compelling person. But the, the funny thing about that is that now that I'm preparing a show about him, I have to detach myself in a way and my personal feelings about him to try and create and understand the character of Thomas Sowell so that I can interpret him um, as an actor in the way that Clifton Duncan would put, would portray Thomas Sowell. Are you going to imitate him? Are you, are you coming up with Clifton Duncan's Tom Sowell voice and mannerisms? That's an interesting challenge. It is an interesting challenge because what you don't want to do is you don't want to, uh, you don't want to, descend into SNL style impersonation. No. What you want to do is embody that person, the essence of that person as much as possible. Soul's really interesting because he has a unique, uh, I don't know if you call it a dialect specifically, but it's, it's a bit of Southern. He was born in North Carolina, but it's tinged with, you can hear the New York in his voice. Very much. Uh, yeah. Very much so. So yeah. what, so what, what you want to do is you want to, as much as possible, internalize and personalize and incorporate the sort of external aspects about himself and repurpose it through my own body, my own voice. Because mm -hmm. cool, the, the, the trap is that if you become fixated on these external things, then you miss what's underneath. And that's what people really want to see anyway. So, you know what? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, just, you know, just to answer your question uh, succinctly. Um, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, something you might want to know that I'm not sure comes across in the clips if you're, if you're doing him is that in real life, he's a little bit more vigorous with bodily movement while he talks 
than he is on TV. He's given to going like this, and he will go like this. That's the way he, he moves from up here, which you don't know if you're sitting with a microphone and, and, and sitting in a seat. He's a, he's, a, he's a passionate speaker in real life. Okay. That's something that I found interesting when I actually met him. Well, I love that you said that, too, because I think people think of him as an intellectual. When you think of the intellect, you think of the mind and someone who lives in their head. But my what what I get from him is, like you said, a very passionate, really a very fiery man. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of fire inside him, a lot of passion inside him, which is um, which is then translated into into his words. And he's he's got a way of kind of cutting you down or getting the point across in very few words, very harshly, very pointedly. but not necessarily um, like raising his voice or getting into these kinds of things. But, you know, people have asked me like, well, how are you going to do it? Because he does mostly (laughs) interviews. I'm like, well, he's a human being, you know, there literally are stories of him. You know, he writes about how he's, you know, fighting with like homeless people on the trains. And, and, you know, he's, he's not like, he's not, um, He's not averse or he wasn't averse when he was younger to a scrap, be that, be that with ideas or, or physical. So, Very um, you know, he's, that, that's what's so interesting about it because once you begin to do a deep dive and you do the, the discovery process, I mean, I had a, the great Zelda Fitchhandler who was one of my teachers who you may know. Um, she once said that information is inspiration. So right now it's all about filling myself up with as much uh, information as possible. And that's going to help fire up my intuition. And, what what I what I sh- am sure I will find over time is um, that once I internalize everything correctly, um, I want to get so good that I can improvise as <laughs> him. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like that. Like that would be the bee's knees, basically. If if we can still say that, the old He's, slang. <laughs> the cat, the <laughs> um, you know, yeah, he told me so once swell. actually. This I don't know if this can fit into your piece, but he said that he thinks he met W. E. B. Du Bois. He said that when he was little, he was in that building in Harlem that Du Bois lived in, and a man came out of the elevator who he was introduced to, who was treated with great reverence. And in his memory, he thinks that he met Du Bois, but he's not sure because he was too young to know who it was. But you can tell he did. So there was that little spark, and that's a nice bit of his story. Oh, also, one wonders that if he did meet Du Bois, if uh, if his esteem for Du Bois, if if there was any, <laughs> was diminished by the fact that Du Bois is a Harvard graduate. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and also, can I just ask, is it is it Du Bois or is it Du Bois? Are we just du- saying Du Bois because he's black du American or is it Du Bois? It was Du Bois. And I know that not only because that's how everybody says it. Well, this is, yeah, I, I think, yeah. My first girlfriend from like 400 years ago ended up marrying, how did this go? Ended up marrying a man much older than her whose grandmother went to school with Du Bois. The grandmother, a white woman of Great Barrington, said of Du Bois that he was quote unquote uppity. That was the, that was the, the memories. Oh, yes. And in recalling that, the man, her grandson, said Du Bois. But then again, maybe he had picked that up from the fact that he's celebrated in Great Barrington. That's my little connection with my own connection with Du Bois. But um, I'm, I think it was Du Bois. I've never heard anybody say it any other way, including in older clips. But yeah, not not Du Bois. Oh, by the way, Clifton, should we mention that? Are you still doing the? Um, are you still soliciting donations for your piece? Should we should we talk about that? Well, no. Well, the, the fundraiser just closed a few days ago. Um, okay. It was a, a roaring success. Uh, you know, I, I initially, because initially my ask was just for $10,000 and you want to kind of lowball it, you know, but, but I was also like, dude, I'm trying to write a play. Like, who's going to care about that? You know? <laughs> um, and it's funny because uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, libertarian uh, podcaster and writer named Tom Woods, who really was um, a big, big um, reason for all this happening in the first place. And he was like, you know, I had a, I had a, um, he said, I had a friend on my podcast who was trying to write a book and I, I appealed to my audience and he was able to raise $40,000. I'm not saying that you'll be able to get that much money, but you know, just, we'll see what happens. And I ended up raising over $140,000. Good God. Um, Damn. Yeah. Wow. What's your timetable? 
The timetable, well, the original ask was for six months. So three months of research and immersion, three months of writing the thing. I don't expect to have a work of genius completed in six months. The point is to have a draft done and to mm -hmm. do a reading for the backers, a virtual mm -hmm. reading and in-person reading for the backers. And then over the next probably at least a year, because um, I, I expect to be, because it's been so successful, um, it's given me the leeway to say this can be my priority for, the, for an indefinite period going forward. I'm assuming um, that you can't, it's not going to be a biography, and maybe you don't want to talk about it yet, but I don't imagine that his particular life would lend itself to, then I did this and then I did that. And so it would be more thematic, right? Well, you always have to think of, um, it's difficult because you don't want to try, you don't want to speak anything into existence at, at this early stage in the process. You know, Rick Rubin talks about how at the beginning of any process, he feels a, a ton of anxiety because you, still, you don't know what the thing is going to be. But sometimes it's easier to know what you don't want than to understand what you do want. And one thing that I don't want is for the piece to be a straight bioplay. Because you can just go to, Rick, to Wikipedia, you know, to get the bullet points of his life. Um, the, the, the question is, how do you create a dynamic, compelling piece of theater? Which, which are the more interesting and dramatically rich um, portions of his life? How do you arrange those events into a dramatically satisfying whole? And, you know, on top of all of that, as an actor, how do you get underneath what's going on to express, you know, whatever that might be happening in the psyche and the soul of this character? Um, it's really, I think what's really interesting is a big part of his life um, has been about ideas and intellect. And the theater, as you well know, is a space where ideas and language is heavily um, is is heavily centered. So it could be a wonderful medium to debate the prevailing visions, as you might call it, of our time. Um, but again, you have to marry that. I mean, it's like doing a Shaw play. It's very, very intellectual and there's, it's very speech uh, <laughs> linguistically heavy or an <laughs> Oscar Wilde play. It's but you have to figure out. out. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You have to fit. You have to figure out what the passion is underneath all of that. And I have the training and the chops um, to do that. And I'm very confident in it. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. But again, if it's, a, if it's just a bio play, if it's just an intellectual exercise, it's not going to, it's not going to be compelling. And what I also want to do, which I think will be great. And what I'm really looking forward to is touring the show around the country in the way that stand up comedians do. Because you don't know what the play really is until you get it in front of an audience. They teach you how to perform the play. You can only do so much sitting at a table and, you know, sit, you know, and, and gazing at your navel in a rehearsal studio. Once you're in front of an audience, they will teach you what the show really needs to be. Where mm -hmm. are they laughing? Where are they listening? Where are they shuffling their, their playbills and kind of disengaging? Where can you afford to take some time and let, and let the words and ideas really sit with them? Where do they seem to be reacting emotionally? These kinds of things you can't figure out if you're reading over Zoom or, in, or just in a rehearsal hall. And so at the end of it, once the play is tightly honed in front of live organic people, mm -hmm. and part of it, you know, my, my sort of insidious side hustle is just getting, getting all of America interested and excited about theater and going to, and going to shows. But um, and then uploading it online for everyone to see, yeah, and for the for the world to enjoy. Two things. Um, you might already know this, but just I couldn't write a play at gunpoint. But if I were writing this, I would incorporate somehow that Sowell is a is a dedicated amateur photographer. He used to send me some of his pictures, and if it were a musical, certainly you'd have projections in the background, and he would sing a song about how he's observing rather than participating, that sort of thing. I'm going to drop a very obscure reference to one of the lesser candor in Ed musicals, The Happy Time. It would be kind of like that, and Robert Goulet would be singing. So that's just <laughs> some, something to know. But also, Clifton, why did you decide to become an actor? And I don't mean you personally, but I'm listening to you talking about touring the country and doing this in front of audiences who sometimes will not be exactly forgiving. And I'm just thinking to myself, you get up and portray characters in front of people. And it's just like me asking Glenn sometimes, what would lead you to want to write a memoir? Now I'm going to ask you, I'm, I'm beginning to become a very narrow person, apparently. I just sit at home and read books and play the piano. But what <laughs> makes you want to be an actor? You know, it's very strange because I can't really answer that question. Um, you, you know, I, I joke that my life 
would have been far easier if I were one of those kids who, you know, when I was six years old, I saw a production of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, my God, I have to do this for the rest of my life. Oh, my God. That's like, true. I wish I was one of those kids. Um, but as, it as always a straight man. That show too. Yeah. Say what? It, it always is that show, too. <laughs> it's always <laughs> that show. But, the, but as a straight man, uh, I, I entered the theater as most straight men do, which is following a girl. Um, I was in French class, actually, in my high school. And uh, I dropped out, much to the chagrin of my teacher in my third year of class. And I was chasing some girl named Danielle, who had my last name as well, in, <laughs> in the class. And... Um, you know, I, I think I sort of got the idea, like it wasn't like there's no one in my family who was an actor or really even an artist. Um, and I was going to be an illustrator. Like when I was a kid, I dabbled in illustration. I was in band. I was doing short uh, stories and poetry. Um, so I was always an artsy fartsy kid, but performing never crossed my mind. And, um, you know, then one day I was I drew a, a, like the far side. Gary Larson's far side was a huge in, uh, influence on me. And so I drew this cartoon in my art class and it was uh, two eggs in a boxing ring and one had punched through the other egg. And, and I just wrote the caption, egg beater. So I'm like, you know, maybe, I have to be maybe 16, 15, 16 years old. And um, this woman walks by and I think she was one of the, I forgot who, who she was, but she, she just looks at this, <laughs> this, this, you know, silly cartoon that I'd drawn. And she goes, you need to be on TV. I don't know what it was, you know, like, like, it, like the worst, like the worst way to make a decision about what you're going to do with your life is some random school administrator telling you what to do. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and I, and I was also a very shy kid. I was a military brat. I, you know, my life was upheaved every three to four years and I had upheaved. to make new friends all over again. And, um, and I was very shy. And, uh, but then we ended up, I get, got to this drama class and found that I had an aptitude for behavior, for mimicry. Um, I, you know, I'd always been a class clown, so I kind of knew what was funny and what was not. And, um, then ultimately when college time came around, it was just cheaper to go to, in, to go to theater school in state than to go to, to the Savannah College of Art and Design, which is where I thought I was going to go. Um, but I was also kind of a weirdo and I started, uh, and I was 17 when I went to college and that was pretty much the first time where I began to get very, very, very positive what, feedback. What year are we in when you're 17? This was uh, 2000. Okay. Um, so I, you know, and I started doing shows, getting cast in shows. In my first year of uh, undergrad, I did a play called The Day the Bronx Died, which is a beautiful memory play mm -hmm. set in 1968. And um, I'd been a class clown and kind of a goofball, but that was the first time I said, wait a minute, I can, I can do dramatic stuff. And so it's funny to me saying all of this, that 25 years ago, um, I was being encouraged left and right by my peers and my, and, my, um, and my teachers and mentors who were telling me, hey, if you bust your butt, got, if you work hard, you, you, you'll have a very long career. You have a lot of potential. And they were right about that. So it's just funny to me to see now that the industry is now um, self-immolating over this idea that it's a white supremacist industry. And uh, no one, no one has ever, ever impeded me. No one has ever made me feel out of place. No one has ever made me feel not included until a bunch of mostly white progressives decided that I don't belong in the industry, which I think is ironic. You have provided a beautiful transition. That's exactly where I wanted to go. You're welcome, John. <laughs> that, was, that was good. I have been told by, um, for a good couple of years now, by conservatives and liberals that the theater is immolating itself because it's been taken over by a hard leftist, let's say, face it, woke sensibility that is driving theater companies around the country to program hectoring, hard left, woke sermonizing plays that audiences don't like. And that basically audiences are not coming back to the theater after the pandemic because of this. That is a damn good story. But I wonder whether you could say as somebody who's part of the industry, is that actually happening or is that just something that the right and we liberals wish would happen because it makes a good story and because it's something going on with the occasional theater rather than most of them? Is there really a, a big sea change in the industry? Well, there was a huge, um, uh, over the past, I'd say throughout 2023, there were major, major articles, LA Times, Washington Post, 
New mm-hmm. York Times several times. Even right wing outlets like The Federalist were reporting on this. And um, they were talking about how 20 to 30 percent of the audience has not returned post pandemic. There were experts predicting this is Peter Marks of The Washington Post, the theater critic in Washington, um, who was talking about how there were experts predicting that the industry will contract by 50 percent. Um, um, well, by this year, um, there are theaters across the country which are either truncating their seasons or closing outright. On top of that, there's they're they're now forming coalitions of theaters now, and they're demanding. <laughs> I, I have to laugh, but they're demanding more government aid to support the arts. Um, so, but is this uh, because are, of wokeness or because people stopped going to the theater because they stayed home? This is this is they claim that they're recovering from the pandemic. What is difficult about that is that other live, uh, other live performance, uh, performance um, uh, fields, pro wrestling, combat sports, bounced right professional back. sports, bounced right back. And in some cases are doing better than ever, even with declining ratings in the case of the NBA and the NFL, right? So people are still, like Taylor Smith is, Taylor Smith, Taylor Swift is breaking records right now. You know what I'm saying? Beyonce is still Gilbert selling out shows, mm-hmm. you know? So- People are still, my argument is people still, even in these economic times, they still are spending money on entertainers and entertainment that they want to spend it on. They're still hungry for live performance. They're just not hungry to see the theater. So between the, what I view as a, as a histrionic pandemic response on top of the, uh, the social politics that's been the one-two punch that has really diminished the relevance and vibrancy uh, of the theater in the past few years. What is um, what is the source of the conflict between you and theater personally? You're saying that people have decided that, that you're no good. What 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 happened? Well, for one, uh, you are I good. use the term. Say what? Because you are good. And so, what what's the friction? Well, the friction started in 2020. Um, I, and it's part of it is pandemic, part of it is politics. The irony is that in 2020, I began the first three months, I was totally in what I call the COVIDian cult. I mean, I was literally sanitizing my groceries and my mail, right? So if anyone wants to accuse me of being a denialist, they can't do that because my roommate literally thought I was crazy because I'd be walking around our apartment in a mask. I called it my little uh, hazmat suit, just maniacally trying to disinfect every handle and knob in our little shoebox apartment. Um, I never felt that way. That, that, so you started there. Okay. I started yeah. there. I started yeah. there. And then my mind changed over time. But what I, my, my objections began, well, in 2020, all the social unrest happened. And I saw these sweeping changes in the industry that was responding. I mean, I, I was getting messages from these aggrieved white women that I worked with in the past who were just like, I'm so sorry about what's happening. It's, it's all the George Floyd stuff, you know? Oh. And, um, and they're, I'm so sorry about what's happening. And I'm thinking to myself, bitch, this is racist. Like you're sitting there assuming that your life is better than mine, that I'm suffering and in pain because I'm and black. Black people are all this one united organism. Yeah, exactly. This is why, this is why I call progressivism a socially acceptable white supremacy, because it presumes that all black people everywhere are living in, in fear and, of, and resentment of white people everywhere who aren't even alive anymore. Although, of course, a great, you and I both know that a great many black people, including ones of influence, do say, that that's how we all feel, and that you or me, if we deny it, are not genuinely part of the black community. So with that white woman, I must admit I sympathize, although I'm furious that you know we have to deal with that phoniness and that well, that's, dehumanization. That's what's hard about it, because you know they're coming from a good place. You know they want to help. But at the same time, it's like, I don't need it. I really don't need it. I, like, I'm actually good. You know, th- you know th- right. this man's life, the tragedy of this man's life, which I'll agree is a tragedy. Like, why are you even in these circumstances in the first place? Like, what, what circumstances in your life led to you, led to this point? Um, but again, this idea that I need to be uh, condescended to. And the joke is that, you know, because of this white woman's politics, in the eyes of leftists, she's probably blacker than both of us politically, which is <laughs> ironic. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and I was getting these surveys from people, I'll name names, but like New York Stage and Film as a place I had a great relationship with. But 
you know, it was like this survey about how do you feel entering white theater spaces? Now, John, I've been an actor for 20 years. Not once have I or anyone ever stepped foot on, onto a stage, into a, onto a TV or film set, into a rehearsal hall and said, God damn, it's white in here. No one's ever done that. <laughs> no one has ever done that. And yet in 2020, this term white theater spaces came up. And, you know, and I was getting, you know, like another one, uh, Chautauqua, I was a member of their theater company in 2007, 2008, had a wonderful time there, was invited back the next year to do a one man show I created there. Um, and yet I get this email that's saying, we know, and I hate when progressives do this, we know that you, you feel you're tired, you feel excluded, and we know that you're in pain. Excluded so here's from a long what? list. Uh. Excluded from what? And the irony uh. is, when I was there at Chautauqua, the only people that pointed out that I was one of the few black people there were all the white folks there that were like, man, <laughs> whoa. I was like, well, thanks a lot, bro. I, I didn't feel uncomfortable and out of place until you just said that just now. But, but Clifton, what do you say about the people who would insist that that's how they feel? Which, from what I'm beginning to smell, is maybe most black people in theater these days, they would say, although I think a lot of them are just joining in with the herd because they're afraid of getting their feelings hurt. But a lot of them would say that they have felt black in these spaces and just didn't feel comfortable speaking up until 2020, that there is this coded racism that they're suffering in all sorts of ways and that it needs to be eliminated. Like, you, you know that you're expressing this view in public. You are rather unusual as a black actor. Why do the other ones feel so differently? They're insecure. Look, I had the same... I had the same thing. I had the same thing, John. I felt the same way. Um, if I can, I'll tell you a quick story about when this all changed for me. I was at Williamstown, which, you know, if you know, if you know theater, you know, it's one of the, it's know, the top the level. Yeah. Prestigious. Um, you know, so I, I, I had the privilege of, I, I can't say hired because you, you have to pay to be there, but I was one of, I, I was a young actor. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. They, so they have different tiers. Like there's the stars that go there, right? I mean, at least when I was there, I'm sure it's different now, but there's the stars and then there's the, the, you know, and the professionals, and then they have a bunch of students. And so then there's the, there was the non-equity actors, which were, which they had culled from, maybe culled isn't the right word, but they, um, they auditioned at all the top conservatories, you know, NYU, Juilliard, Yale, and that, that was their non-equity company. And then there were an army of like hundreds of interns from undergrad programs all over the country. So um, basically the, the first day that we were there, um, the 24 of us non-equity actors all got into this big room because we were there to audition uh, for uh, a series of one act plays to be done by these four young assistant directors. Um, and I did a I did uh, a monologue from a place from from a piece called uh, a play called Before It Hits Home, which it got me into grad school basically. And excuse me, it got to the point where people who weren't even in the room, like the the uh, the um, artistic director Roger Rees, the late Roger Rees, may he rest in peace, um, was like, you know, we're so happy to have you here. People were <laughs> like, yeah, I heard about your I heard about your 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 monologue, man. That you know is really astounding, and uh, yet. The next day, when the uh, the callbacks went up, the list of callbacks went up. I was on I was not on any of these uh, sheets, and that would have been fine. That's the life of the actor. You 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 spend most of your time looking for work. Um, but none of the other black actors, the other two black guys, were on any of these lists, and it was galling because you know, and like for instance, in one play, one play was um, one of the characters was a gay man, but one of the other black guys was, was a gay man. But the role ended up getting cast with one of my classmates who was a straight white male. And I'm like, mm -hmm. really? You know, we weren't right for any of these parts. Like, I'm more of a leading man kind of type. You know, Rama was more of a, a portly, every man type. And Jordan, who was the gay guy, you know, he, this bass voice kind of fade, but not too much, but just a really unique kind of quality to him. So they can't say that any of us were alike. So anyway, long story short, it, there was that that went on. And then on the main stage shows, um, I got to watch my white colleagues, you know, play sometimes multiple uh, featured roles in these great shows, working with these great actors and directors. But meanwhile, myself and Jordan were in the ensemble of a really bad musical. And then uh, Rama had the only speaking part among the three of us. And he was playing a butler in this Alice and Janney play. <laughs> On top of all of that, 
um, Susan Laurie Parks was doing her 365 uh, plays in 365 days around the country. Mm-hmm. Um, for those who don't know, Susan Laurie Parks, wonderful black playwright. Um, and she did this series of one act plays, uh, 365 of them that she was doing around the country, um, these short plays. And um, there was an administrator at Williamstown who said, you know, we don't think that Susan Laurie Parks would ever have a production here at Williamstown. And I was thinking to myself, now, now you talk about feeling black. I felt black as hell that summer because I was just like, there's no reason that I should be sitting here, you know, while these mediocre, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say, but these, these mediocre white colleagues are sitting here working with stars. I'm sitting here, you know, not doing anything. This is bullshit. So sorry, you're saying this, is, this has changed? Because, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm a very theater adjacent person. And there was a part of me that flirted with doing performance in the 80s and the 90s. And there was so much of this. And I can't claim, I would never say I'm the leading man type. It's not that I think that I was going to, you know, be a star. But too often in, you know, college and also community theater circumstances, it was clear to me that the color of my skin made it so that it was highly unlikely that I would be cast as anything but the help, being in, you know, the chorus and things like that. And that it, it was clearly race. I remember there was a production of The Prince and the Pauper that never made it to Broadway, but I was in a kind of a pre-pre-tryout. Lord Hartford, the guy they had playing Lord Hartford, dropped out. And um, I'm in the chorus. And frankly, he is a sardonic character who clearly has a low voice. And I'm sitting there, and frankly, I sing well. They got one person after another stepping into that role until finally somebody realized when the third person dropped out that I might be able to halfway fake it. And the truth is, it was one of the best things I ever did, but I only got it by accident. And so I decided, no, it's just, you know, benign, well, unthinking racism is such that I really am not going to even try to do this. And I stopped doing performance, except when it was my friends who could see me as a whole person and might cast me as something other than the help. Are you saying that that has changed? Because if so, I'm glad and I can kind of tell that a lot of it has changed, but you're existing in a different time. Well, you see, you said the term unthinking racism. And what I interpreted it as at the time was unthinking bias. Like, you know, people have grown up like they're not malicious. They've no. grown up in a certain way and they're saying, oh, I have an idea in my head of what this person could be. So at worst, it's a lack of imagination. That's what and I That's thought. forgivable. Yeah. And, and to the extent that there is a problem or was a problem, I, in my opinion, it was mitigated by just saying, you know what? We're going to open this role. Uh, you, you would see casting breakdowns that would say open to any ethnicity, although they end up casting a white person anyway. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know, but open to any ethnicity. And that was cool. It's, it's one thing to do that versus top down edicts. You have to have this kind of uh, of, uh, of demographic makeup in your company, in your administration, yada, yada, yada. Because th- for me, that's what I mean, it's like it's like central planning for art. It's 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 just as bad for societies as it is for art. Um, so on one hand, that's why I feel torn, because on one hand, it's like it's nice that people are understanding now. That after Much decades, more. yeah. Well, well, after decades of you know ACT American Conservatory Theater, uh, Yale Drama, Juilliard, and NYU grad, there are now dozens, if not hundreds, of of actors who are not white who can handle heightened texts and who have advanced training. And mm-hmm. so, to me, and I was talking to my friend about this. You know, we got out in two thousand and nine, and it wasn't like this. It wasn't uh, this radical or extreme when we got out. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, going back to my story, you know, you mentioned you have friends that see you as a human being. And eventually over the course of the summer, so the second round of auditions came around for these one act plays. And guess who was at the top of each of these lists? And at that point, you know, and then I got cast in the lead in this really wonderful play called Hotline, which is about a suicide hotline, which is really, really funny. Um, but it was all tainted. And I just said to myself, am I here because I'm the best person for this role, or am I here to assuage some white progressive's guilt? And on top of that, you know, I wasn't getting laid. I I was very, I was very upset that summer. And I had a classmate who was like, well, you know, your problem, Clifton, is that there's only two black girls here. Now, John, white girls been chasing me since I was 16 years old, okay? And (laughs) it's just, my, my other classmate was there and he was like, I can't believe you're saying this. So basically it was a heavy, heavy, it was, and on top of all this. 1959. Wow. Well, on top of all this, Sean, which is hilarious, I was I was actually being moved into 
I was going into my second year of grad school, but I was being bumped up into a third year show. We were doing uh, Jim of the Ocean, August Wilson's show. Yeah. So I'm also reading like slave narratives, <laughs> you know, throughout the summer. So I was like, it was a blackity black summer. Yeah. And, and the thing about it is that, and this kind of goes into other issues for me as well, is that no one was going to say anything. You know what I mean? Like the other actors were like, oh my God, this is so messed up. And the other directors were really embarrassed. Um, but the other guys weren't going to say anything. No one else is going to say anything. And I did. And I was like, this is wrong and messed up. But, you know, I reached a certain point where I just said, you know what, man? I, I am going to stop using my race as a crutch for all the things that happened in my life. And whether you're a, a, a racist KKK member or a racist white progressive, if you can't see me as a human being before you see me as my demographic, be that black or male, then that's your problem. Nothing to do with me. So that was that that one degree difference. That but how do you set- get away from it? How how do you? Because frankly, it's inescapable that you are seen as this black person who needs help, as opposed to just a person. Because now they feel like that's the right thing to do. So how do you? How do you get away from it? How do you? By doing one man shows, is is that the idea? You just just ignore it. I mean, you know, oh. and mm. so. And here's the thing, you know, John, because. And Viola Davis talked about this as well. She was being interviewed by Tavis Smiley when uh, she was uh, nominated for The Help. And Tavis, uh, I think, said what a lot of black people felt, which was, I'm happy you're nominated, but I'm just, I'm troubled by what you're nominated for. And it was this really the great outcry exchange. outcry over that film was so fucked up. <laughs> I, I get angry thinking about the way people worked to hate that film. Anyway, go ahead. Well, it I I hated that. It took me two days to watch that movie. I was like, dude, even the white characters in this are are bad. Like, you this too. Is, this is <laughs> bad. I I just didn't think it was a good movie. I didn't, I didn't like the think movie. it was an offensive movie though. A lot of people hated that she loved the children, the white children. Thought that it didn't show enough of the violence, which I frankly thought it did. I thought that it was a candy cane movie. It was you know it wasn't deep, yeah. but I didn't think that yeah. it whitewashed anything and. So many people despised it. Sorry to step on your toes. I didn't know you were. <laughs> no, no. You know, I mean, because my issue, it wasn't, you know, yeah, you could, you could say, oh, this white woman was writing about yada, yada, yada. But I was like, these characters are, are caricatures and they're paper thin. And this movie's ridiculous. And that was my, that was my objection to it. But, you anyway. know, but they're in this exchange and Tavis says, you know, I'm troubled by what you're being nominated for. And this wonderful moment where, where Viola says, um, my, my friend Viola says, uh, you know, that attitude and Tavis goes, yeah, yeah. She goes, is destroying black artists. Mm. And her point, Go and I felt this as well, which is if so many black actors are stuck because they feel they have to, this, this concept of representation, meaning, which I feel like is kind of racist because it's like, you know, if you, if one of us can stand in for all of us, then you know, what's the point? But, you know, there is this unspoken idea, I think, that you have to, because you're there, you're representing the black race, you have to uphold this, this kind of standard. And for me, I'm like, well, that's just boring because then you have... Dull, yeah. It's dull. You have characters that are perfect. They have no scars on their soul. Like, who wants to play a character like that? And it's boring. And then you, the, the next thing is that people say you're playing this noble, artificial character and not a real person. But what's the, right. what, 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 what do you do? You know, you're an angry black man or you're a noble black man. There's nothing you can do right. And what's the point of that? Because eventually we all die. It just it ends up being this exercise that's joyless and, and useless. Yeah. Well, well, do you know the work of Don Bogle, the film I historian? I was just about to say it's the Donald Bogle problem, but I thought maybe that book is getting too old. But Bogle no. wrote, yeah, he wrote a very yeah. interesting book that probably made sense until about 1980. But after that, he was a man to whom, you know, a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And there's nothing any black person can do right. And then he did it to TV. He did a book called Primetime Prime Blues. Primetime Blues. I did a, frankly, folks, I did a piece on that for the New Republic about 400 years ago. And it's one of my favorite things that I ever wrote because they gave me 8,000 words. And I thought, I really, really dug in. So I'm just going to give myself a plug for that. But yes, the Donald Bogle problem, go on. Well, that, that's it. You, you brought it up exactly. It's just, you know, what Toms, Bucks, Coons, Mulattoes, yada, yada, yada. Like, it's right like there. there's, 
<laughs> there's nothing you can do. If you're too angry, you're this. If you're too uh, conciliatory or funny, you're this. And so you're, you're trapped as an artist. And mm -hmm. this really came to the fore for me. I was playing Caliban in DC. And you know, for those who don't know, Caliban is a slave. He, ex he is explicitly referred to uh, multiple times throughout the play as a slave. He's he abused and abandoned. You know, he is a slave. And when I was cast, you know, I was the guy in the room who was like, no, abuse me, sling me around the room, do whatever. Like, let's not be, I mean, my, my costume, John, literally had chains on it. And so <laughs> we knew what we were doing. And, but I, I said at that point, I said, you know what, man, everyone else, the audience is going to bring their own baggage to the play. My obligation as an actor is to, is to fully immerse myself in the text. And so what happened is that uh, we had this one high school matinee, which is really funny. You know, you're up at 10 in the morning for these kids. And it was a great production though, and, and they really enjoyed it, so it was fun. But there's a moment, for those who don't know the play, Caliban is a slave, and he ends up meeting these two uh, clowns, essentially, a butler and um, I think actually a jester. And he and, and he's mistaken thinking that, that these two clowns are gonna free him from his captivity. And so he ends up worshiping them. And um, literally there's a scene where he's like kissing this one guy's boot. And when we got to that scene, you know, the black kids from the public school, DC public schools were like, oh no, hell no. And then, you know, but I, so I just went to town because I'm like, I'm not gonna let these people um, sway me from my own uh for my own interpretation and kudos to the actor i was working with who just who didn't wasn't apologetic about it and what emerged is that you know i played the character as a human being and that was where the dignity came from but the thing is i never would have been able to play the role as well as i played it if i'd been stuck the entire time this idea of well what will white people think how will they see me what will black people think how will they see me and ironically there was a woman who responded and saw the show and she was like, I can't believe that in this major Shakespearean production, we have that the two black men with speaking roles are playing slaves. Now, the thing about that is that I was playing Caliban, but the other black person in the show was playing Ferdinand, who is the Prince of Naples, a.k.a. the <laughs> King of Naples. He's a yeah. fucking royal. He's literally a royal. <laughs> like, and so th and that's why I just you can't listen to these but people. She can't see they, it. Right. But they're always going to complain about something. And that's why you can't pay attention to these people. So that sort of shift in mindset, I mean, I'm telling you, my relationships got better. My work got better. My life improved in every way once I let go of this idea that everyone was out to get me. You know what I mean? And um, I want that for everybody. But ironically, that that act of self-possession and self-actualization and self-confidence is what set me sets me at odds with much of the progressive left at the moment, which is, I, I find, ironic. Yeah, these things, these things are, are, are really hard. What about, um, but go back to the, the, the masking thing, because I find, I find it very interesting, and a lot about the pandemic really frustrated me. Um, but you, first, you were washing your apples. Then, then what happened? Well, I mean, I always wash my apples, but... Um, I don't. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't get, get a little rinse and that, that pristine New York tap water. I do. I do not. And I did not wash my hands any more during that time than I ever have. You know, I'm a, oh, I'm a finicky person, but no, I really, I was not COVID um, timorous the way many people were. I just thought to myself, that's not something that's going to happen to me. And it essentially hasn't. And I thought that a lot of what we were made to do was excessive. However, I also knuckled under to the superficial aspects of it because you only go around once. And so what, what happened with you? Well, with me, it was just, um, I began asking questions, which you're not allowed to do in many, as in many uh, sects uh, of, of the left, apparently. Um, and it was ironic because, like I said before, like it's a very New York way to start a sentence. But uh, I was talking to my therapist about this <laughs> um, in, in January. I was like, "There's, I'm in her office, which was in Chinatown, and you know, I got a mask on and I got my gloves and everything, and I uh, and I'm just like, look, there's no way. We were both like, there's no way this thing isn't here already. This is New York City. It's an international travel hub. It's here." Um, so while everyone else was obsessed with uh, Donald Trump's first impeachment and assuring me that it's just the flu, bruh, um, I was like stocking up on food and supplies. I mean, I still have um, 
some nitrile gloves from years ago that I that I collected from that period. Um, I mean, literally, I spent a night in late, it was either late January or early February, walking around Manhattan, lower Manhattan, going into every Rite Aid, CVS, Walgreens I could find, trying to find masks. They were already sold out. So I had to overpay on Amazon, like 75 bucks for what a box made, of 50. What made you that that afraid? That's interesting. When it happened, I thought I knew instantly. I remember actually telling my ex at the time, you know, it was before you had to put a mask on outside, which frankly got absolutely ridiculous in New York. It's ridiculous, State. yeah. And as soon as Trump started talking about COVID the way he did, I remember telling my ex, now it's going to be that the way that you show that you're not a Republican is that you wear the mask all the time because Trump doesn't understand. And my and I remember my ex said, no, you don't have to worry about that. And she's a healthcare person. And I said, no, wait, in about two weeks, you will not be able to go outside in this neighborhood without the mask, without get, getting dirty looks. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly yeah. what happened. But that's how yeah. I felt at the time. I thought we're, this is a serious disease, but we're being asked to go too far, including with the school closings and how long they were. But you found yourself changing your mind because of what? I read a well, little bit. Well, for one, I, had a, I, had a, I have a friend who um, is more center than I am. And she sent me an op-ed from a man named John Yanides, who um, is a world-renowned eminent scientist. And basically, it was a Wall Street Journal op-ed that was like, this might not be as bad as we're making it out to be. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time, John, I was so annoyed. I said, how dare you send me this? <laughs> but, but because I respect her, I mm -hmm. had a, the door open. And I said, you know, and she also sent me like something about, um, you know, during the H1N1 um, whole thing under Obama mm -hmm. and how that was handled. So I, so I already had this kind of door cracked open of like, maybe there's another possibility. But then over time, um, nothing made sense to me. You know, like our numbers were going down, but the restrictions in some places were either increasing uh, or, or staying in place or increasing. Um, there was an article in April of 2020 in the New York Times where they said uh, uh, it was this, this sensational headline that was like, you know, the death toll surpasses 10,000 after 300, after 3,700 deaths are added to the toll. But they were presumed COVID deaths, meaning they weren't even tested. So I'm like, OK, at a time where we're trying to figure out and ascertain just how deadly this this pathogen is, why are we guessing? Like we need as, as accurate information as possible. That didn't make sense to me. Um, and on top of that, you're looking at places around the world doing things differently and um, achieving either worse or similar uh, results. Um, it was just a matter of over time saying this does not make sense. And I think my primary objections began as a bleeding heart artist. And I said, you know, we're shutting down everything that it means to be alive um, just for the sake of living, whatever that really means. And, you know, the face masks. And again, I was masking. I was literally getting made fun of on the subway, John, um, for wearing masks. You were one you know, of those it was early me, adopters. Right. Yeah. It was me and some middle aged Dominican ladies up up in the Heights. <laughs> <laughs> you, I remember that time. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, like there was one, I was going into a Columbus circle actually. Um, and this one guy was hilarious. I was wearing a mask and this, this guy, I love black people so much, man. He was just like, um, the ones that wear the mask, they must be the ones that got it. <laughs> it's like, and there's a logic to that in, in, a, in a sense, there's a logic to that, but you know, but, I, but I was one of the, one of the early ones, you know, even to the point where I was like working out in my mask and almost passing out. Like I was so committed to it, but then, um, I'm trying to figure out how to truncate the story, but it was just a, a series of things where like, this doesn't make sense to me. And then I moved to Atlanta. You, I fled did, to Atlanta. Did you feel that people should be able to do plays in say August of 2020 before there was a vaccine? I'm just asking because I'm, I was kind of in the middle. I masked while inside. I got vaccines. I hated having to wear the mask outside because I, it was clear from a lot of studies that that wasn't necessary. The fact that we had to walk around like that for a year and a half to show that we were Democrats, I thought was absolutely <laughs> absurd. It was, I, I shudder thinking of it now, putting that damn thing on for no reason and having my kids have to do it too. But however, did you think people should be running around doing long days journey into night before there was a vaccine or maybe absolutely. doing it in masks? We never should have closed. We never should have closed because Wouldn't the thing that about made it- people kind of sick? This is a genuine question. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, John. For one, there has never been a successful vaccine for any coronavirus. Like, I knew that going in. There never has been one. Um, 
second, the data that was coming out about the disease itself in the CDC, the beleaguered CDC, you acknowledged that for most people, it's going to be mild to moderate at worst. Um, lastly, there were already doctors around the world who were coming up with treatment protocols to treat the damn thing. Because that was the thing for me. I was like, okay, no one here is talking about lifestyle improvements, especially for black people, like losing weight. My cousin, my lefty liberal cousin in, in Berkeley, who has an autoimmune disorder, told me like, yeah, I lost 60 pounds and the, the vaccine mandates are bullshit. You know what I mean? Like she was responding to actual real data and, and you know, and not trying to force her decisions on other people. But the point is that uh, we sort of forgot that medicine exists. And again, you mentioned Trump. As soon as he brought up hydrochloroquine, um, that became, we, we can't talk about that. There's still a debate raging about ivermectin, you know, whether that works or not. But it wasn't just about miracle drugs. It was people who were saying, okay, this is a very complex disease. And in order to treat it, these are, you know, hit it as early as possible. And here is a combination, a series of drugs you can take, fluvoxamine, budesonide, uh, uh, corticosteroids, blood thinners, all kinds of things, vitamin D, zinc, you know, to, to support the immune system, all kinds of things that you could do to combat this disease um, because you're not going to be able to avoid it. Can I ask and you vaccines on top of that. What are, but are you saying that you, you decided not to do the vaccine? Uh, yeah, I mean, I got the disease in January, I mean, in December of 2020. And so I was like, well, why should I have to be inoculated against something that I've already uh, caught when we have hundreds of studies now at this point about the robustness that suggest or indicate the robustness? Of, How bad uh, was it when you got it? Um, I was out for a few days. Um, you know, it was it was like, I mean, I, I rarely get sick. And so, like, you know, like a lot of men, I kind of bitch up <laughs> when I get sick. Um, but, you know, and I lost my, my my sense of taste was dulled for about two or three weeks. Um, so you had the real thing. So After yeah, the vaccine, you know, I got it once with no symptoms. And frankly, I, I shouldn't say it because I'll be on my back tomorrow. But I don't get it. And I think it's partly because I, I refuse. I just kind of thought there's no way I'm going to be on my back like that. There's no Something else is going to kill me. But you're saying that you actually had the real thing. And yeah, and, and part of it was because I was living in Atlanta. And the thing about Atlanta and why that, that was that completely changed my view of things. Um, for one, I mean, Andrew Cuomo gave this uh, press conference where I said, I, had to, I have to leave New York because he was like, if it saves one life, you know, you, you want to get it, you want to work? Go be an essential worker. Death is worse than a bad economy. Like, I was like, this man I will just. Yeah. Right. I said, I, I, John, I got. I got scared because I said, this man will justify any action he takes because he's living by such a moral, rigid, narrow, uh, excuse me, a, a, a rigid, narrow moral framework right now. He'll do anything. And I'm glad I left because that's what happened, essentially. But I'm in Atlanta. And while in Central Park, right, in New York, people are walking around double masked, you know, <laughs> on their canoes or whatever. Um, in Atlanta, in Piedmont Park, in Midtown Atlanta, my brother threw me a, a Welcome to Atlanta surprise party. And we're there, like, people, are, we're sharing joints. People are, like, there's no one wearing masks. Kids are running around. They're playing cards. People are playing cards, sharing beers. It was a normal day, John. The gyms were still open. They were mask optional. Um, I worked at a nightclub. The bars and nightclubs and strip joints were open. So you can get a lap dance at Magic City, but you couldn't go see a Broadway show. You know what I mean? And so that's, that's when I was like, okay, are you telling me that having titties and fluids on me is, <laughs> is, less, is less dangerous than maybe some spittle from, uh, from, you know, from some actor articulating it? You know, so it just, so, but going to Atlanta, coming to Atlanta, I was like, New York is ridiculous right now. And I, and I said, you know, the show shouldn't be closing. And it was deeper than just, um, you know, all the medical science stuff, you know what I mean? It was like, so, and Clifton, you're saying that the, the plays, I'm opening, I'm trying to keep an open mind. The plays should have stayed open. And we know that people would have been, the spittle would have meant that lots of people would have been coming down with it because we saw that happening after the plays did open. But you're saying that most people weren't going to get that sick anyway. And so just, we should accept that it is something that's in the population the way the flu always is. Is that, is that what you're saying? Essentially, yes. Um, you know, if, if we were talking about something that had like a 10% or 3 or 
infection fatality rate, which is what they were saying at first, then that's something to talk about. But this, it was very clear very early on who was most vulnerable to this and how we could treat it. And so for me, my attitude was we're destroying not just the economy, not just our relationships, but the artists. I feel like I saw a, an industry full of people um, render themselves non-essential. And I'm saying to myself, you guys, especially in New York City, this is one of the cultural centers, meccas of the universe. This is the Broadway community. I mean, if you're in New York, when you go to New York, it's one of the first things people want to do. They want to go see a Broadway show. The arts and the performing arts specifically are, are in just uh, central to the cultural identity of the city. And so to render them as non-essential to me was so offensive. And the fact that all these artists um, who have been complaining about fascism for four years uh, had no problems letting the state dictate that they are not essential and then but, dictate what they inject into their bodies. I just, but, you know. Listen, what about just, just um, what I'm imagining people are thinking, and I'm actually thinking this too. Remember the story that Danny Burstein, the truly amazing, versatile actor, New York actor, he wrote a story about what it felt like when he got COVID and he got the real thing where he felt like he was going to die. I think Mara Gay, um, a New York Times writer, wrote about how she felt barely able to breathe and this lasting for two weeks. Both of those articles where people described really going through hell getting it. You're saying that the risk of undergoing that, and this is pre-vaccine, people should have risked that because there weren't going to be enough of them to matter. You know, what about people who get COVID and they're not just having the sniffles for a few days, but they're on their back and worried that they're not going to be able to take in air? Because at the time, say 2020 and then into 21, I worried about that. Like I could see that there was a need to do things differently, although I think we vastly exaggerated, you know, things that we were told to do. What do you, what do you say to Danny Burstein, for example, based on this? I would say that... Uh... After I got COVID, I got a really, really bad case of bronchitis to the point where there were times where I, I literally couldn't breathe. I had to get an yeah. inhaler, which I'd never had before. Yeah. And even during the worst times of that ordeal, I said to myself, I, I don't want anyone anywhere to feel the way that I'm feeling right now. However, I am one person and I would not want the world to stop functioning because of my own suffering. I wouldn't want to... You know, I mean, it's, it goes back to cost benefit and trade-offs. What are we trading off? And I think people who, I think people who wanted to choose to work should have been able to do so. People who did not want to work uh, should have been able to choose to do so as well. I think that, you know, we can't diminish people's suffering and what they've gone through. At the same time, I also think we can't expect, uh, You can't run away from a respiratory virus forever. And you also can't expect that. Um, I don't think you can expect the entire world and society to. To cater to your vulnerabilities, if that makes sense. It sounds cold. It sounds callous. It sounds uh, harsh. But. It's, it's for me, the trade off between a disease which which most people will be fine from. Um, and are we going to stop everything in, in their tracks and destroy relationships and society and careers and the economy for our fears of a few people who might feel, who might have, who might suffer a lot from it? It's a very difficult and uncomfortable conversation. But to me, that's part of why the response was so botched anyway, because no one could have mature conversations about, you know, you're going to get this. Here's some things you can do to protect yourself um, in addition to vaccines when those are available. But as, as I say, one monkey don't stop no show. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a world that has to keep spinning on top of all of that. So it's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's a classic problem of competing moral virtues, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it the, the, it's the freedom of choice and the freedom to do what you want to do and also protecting uh, protecting others and this aspect of public safety. And it is, um, yeah, it's, com it's complex. I, 
there are two things. And that, that was I've my had... sorry to jump in there because sure. that was my thing from the beginning was that people were taking very very broadly uh, simplistic approaches to solving a very very complex problem, and that was a big part of my my issue with it from from the very beginning. There are two times in my life where my sense of humanity has changed, where I found that people are different from what I thought. One of them was when cell phones came in. I didn't know that most people would want to talk as much as they turned out to. It used to be that when you were walking down the street, you couldn't talk. But once there were these devices, I noticed, wow, probably most people would rather talk all day than be alone. And so I've just adjusted. I now realize what social animals we are. And then in 2020, 21, and I'm still seeing this, I am surprised how many people seem to almost like wearing the mask, whether or not there's any particular danger at all, how many people did not seem to be in much of a hurry to get past the lockdown conditions, you know, canceling parties and things like that. I didn't know that so many people would be content not being able to smell the spring walking around with the, with the mask. And I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around what it is about that certain kind of person. And the standard answer is, well, they might live with somebody who's elderly. They might have pre-existing conditions, sure. But there is a segment of people beyond those two categories who really don't seem to mind walking around in that mask all the time, just kind of because, and I certainly see it among some young people too. And I didn't know that that's something that people would not want to get away from. You know, having that thing on while you're in a plane, it's just, yeah, I'm perplexed. I'm not offended, but I'm just, I'm perplexed. But I think you're offended. You really feel like people are, are, are knuckling under to something rather evil, right? Um, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not offended by it. I just think it's, it's ridiculous and pointless and, and frankly, cult-like. You know, at least, at least the Mormons have the decency with their magic underwear. You can't wear <laughs> them outside of sacred temples. But, you know, and, you know, and you and I, you know, we've, we're New Yorkers. We've both seen like East Asians, for instance, wearing masks for years before oh, it was like, cool. It always looked very peculiar. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and I'm like, I'm like, they must, I mean, they live longer than I do. So they must know something I don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe they're onto something. Uh, but, but, you know, so I, you know, I, I just, I don't have an issue with people making personal choices about, you know, what they feel will protect them. Although it is really, really annoying, for instance, to see perhaps like an elderly obese person wearing a ill-fitting surgical mask that yeah. doesn't even cover their body, like their, right. you know, their face. You know what I mean? I'm like, you're someone who is operating on what you've been told, but you don't have, um, you're not addressing the real problem. But I think for a lot of people, this is a, you know, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, spitballing, but you know, a difference I notice um, among the more left-leaning and more right-leaning people, and uh, I preface all this by saying I don't like speaking in these generalities, and I, I feel like these labels now are less and less helpful than they used to be. However, for the sake of simplicity, I'll say that the, the right seems to respond more to strength, and the left um, is very comfortable with vulnerability, and I, I don't want to say weakness. And so I wonder if... This idea that you, a, you are vulnerable and you are susceptible to attack um, is sort of ingrained into a lot of people. And so they kind of took that and ran with it. And so I'm going to do whatever I can, um, not just to protect myself, but also to hide. The world is scary and dangerous and all these scary fascists and right wingers out there um, and right supremacists. We got to protect ourselves. Um, I, I notice on the left is a, a tendency to for people to wear their uh, their mental illnesses sort of in as and character flaws as badges, um, and there is mm. a logic to that in terms of like you know you feel like you belong because you're not the only person who's sort of damaged and hurting. Um, but on top of all of that, you know there was there was a constant constant propaganda campaign of saying you're going to die, and you know there was a great I think it was the Brookings Institute. Was it? Clifton, I hate to say that everything you just said, that's so depressing and it's going to hurt a lot of people's feelings, but I would be lying if I did not say that I agree with you. That difference between well, left and right, and it is a generalization, but it's a valid one. And I think you're right. I think that is a lot of what it is. Anyway, go well, ahead. You know, well, but, well, on top of all of that, you know, there was this, um, there was this Brookings, I think it was Brookings Institute that did this uh, study that they showed that, uh, that, that found, that suggested anyway 
that um, both Democrats and Republicans vastly overestimated um, the probability of landing in the hospital if you got the disease. I mean, but Democrats were, I mean, Republicans were bad, but Democrats were, they thought that there was like a 50% chance that you'd wind up hospitalized. The, mm-hmm. the true number is anywhere between like zero and 5%, depending you know, on your age and other comorbidities. Yeah, there was something, I mean, after about a year of it, I started having some conversations. I talked to somebody who was on the front lines in a major hospital who, you know, saw the worst of this. And I said, um, I'm not going to write about this. This is just between you and me. It's been so long now that I'm airing it. But this was, he worked in New York hospital. I said, have you seen anybody die who was not large or somehow severely compromised medically? Have you seen anyone die who was not that category? And he said, no. Not a single person. And then after a while, it became clear that, um, you know, I thought in my demographic, my upper middle class demographic, I started asking people, okay, we all know that, you know, somebody's teenager got COVID with no symptoms. Sure. We all know maybe one person who got it and was on their back for a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. But after a while, I said, do you know anybody who's died? Do you know anybody who's died from COVID? And if they, if they did, were there certain conditions? you know, such as being in your 90s or being very large or having some other disease. Do you know anybody? Have any of us died? And after about a year, it was clear that no, no, that was extremely rare. Most of us hadn't really been sick. And yet you weren't supposed to talk about that, that a lot of the death and sickness was if you were predisposed to it already. That was considered fighting words to mention that. I still don't know anybody in my world who died. In late 2020, the CDC put out a report. They found that over 70% of the people that were hospitalized with severe COVID were overweight or obese. Yeah. And I had this, I had this semi-viral tweet. Um, you, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm a smart ass. And I said, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, but it was something like, I think that uh, we should mandate a body mass index of under 30 or under 25 or whatever. Oh, you, you to, knew to, what you were going to get. That. Right. Well, yeah. well, because and here's the point, and and they reacted exactly as I thought they would, because I because the point was I don't think you should be able to tell people what they should do with their bodies, and the thing is, urging people to lose weight would have ob- would have objectively helped people help protect people from this disease, and at least based on what we what we know or what we found, and as far as comorbidities go, and people said that I just want fat people to die. So what I came away with that was that, uh, they, A, they missed the point about bodily autonomy, but on top of that, it was like they would rather protect um, fat people from words they might find offensive than protect them from what they're calling the worst pandemic in a century. Well, Cliff and I, I would have to say <laughs> to that, that it's so hard to lose weight and, and it's so hard to keep it off. And remember, all this is before Ozempic etc. I mean, if you lose, a, if you are fat, to use that word these days, you know, you, if you lose 25 pounds, it's this almost superhuman effort. And unless you want to spend the rest of your life hungry, you're going to gain it back and more. And so is it really fair to say that people should lose, lose weight? Nobody can lose weight and keep it off. Well, see, John, but, but John, the, the point is, I wasn't, I, that wasn't the point that I was making. The point was about the mandates. But what, what I found interesting you know, and again, I'm not someone who makes fun of people because they're fat, because no. you don't know what that person's past is no. with their relationship to food, you're, you're or not, their, I don't their trauma, whatever it all. is. Yeah. You know, but but the point was, we are shutting down society and we're ostracizing people. And I haven't seen any public health officials say, you know what, it's probably a good idea to try and reduce your stress and improve your sleep and exercise. They close the gyms, John. Exercise, you know, and, and get proper nutrition. These are basic things that you can do to help protect yourself, not just against this disease, but against many other things. And these, uh, these online leftists came at me and thought that I was fat shaming. And I was like, no, dude, that's like really, they're like, you know, the body mass index is not even like an accurate, me-. I'm like, dude, I know all that. That's not the point. That's not the point that I'm making. So it's just, it's just you know, there was, no, there was no logic around any of what was going on. And my whole, my whole approach from Almost not almost day one, because like I said, I was uh, I was freaked out by it, by it. But my whole thing was like, we should be taking a multi pronged approach. My, you know, my friend Jay Bhattacharya was one of the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, 
you know, that was his whole thing from the, from the day one. It was just, you know, we know who's most vulnerable. Let's use our massive resources to protect them and let everyone else live their lives um, uh, like, like they want. So, Clifton, and you never got the vaccine. You would be vaccine. called a eugenicist. What? Yeah. You never got the vaccine. No, I never got it. I and never had any plans to. on getting it. No. And the thing is, and, you know, John, you, you messaged me and you were like, you know, my, my anti-vax position. That's, that's the thing. There seems to be this weird kind of uh, defect among the bourgeoisie. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is you, but they, 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 they have some kind of cognitive impairment where they can't distinguish between um, uh, moral, ethical and scientific objections to a, to a specific policy. Um, they can't distinguish that from being against any and all vaccines. My, right. my position I was, was never... I was shorthand. I, I don't think that you're against all vaccines. But the, but the problem is, it's one of these words like fascist and Nazi. I mean, it's one of the most toxic social labels, and it was used yes. deliberately to make people shut up. And uh, and that's one thing you, you mentioned learning about people. I said, I've, I've never had any opinions about vaccines. I've never been an advocate for or against them. I often joke that, look, if I'm going to a country, I'm shooting a movie, they're like, yo, you, need, you should get this vaccine for yellow fever. I'm like, I get it because I don't want yellow fever. It sounds pretty nasty. Yeah. yeah. And... <laughs> You know what I mean? And so, but this whole thing, but, but because I said these mandates are coercive and unethical and unsci anti-scientific and wrong, then I became an anti-vaxxer. And then I was lumped into people who were like, there is no virus and who watch bit shoot and Alex Jones all the time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was so disingenuous and so dishonest and it was used as a cudgel. And I think a lot of it in the entertainment industry, they had this idea that they were weeding out and purging a bunch of MAGA weirdos. Yes. And I'm like, guys, black Americans vote over 90% Democrat and they're the least vaxxed demographic. So what you're doing is you're niggerizing people that you don't know that you're, do that you're, that you're niggerizing with all of this thing, with, with all of this. And it didn't stop shows from closing. It didn't stop outbreaks from happening. It didn't stop people from getting sick. And on top of that, and it's funny because as someone who never took the vaccine, I've been watching for the past two years as people who get who did take it and get boosted. They, they're sick every five fucking months. And meanwhile, there's this study that came out of the Cleveland Clinic. 50,000 uh, participants where they found that there was a relationship between the number of doses you'd had and your likelihood of getting of testing positive. You know, I, I want to use my I words carefully. I didn't know that. Interesting. There's that. There's also uh, studies about uh, uh, the class switch among um, among antibodies, the IgG antibody group, you know, and, and how the vaccines are impacting those. And, you know, so there's all kinds of data out there which you could use to form an argument against like this is not the right choice for me. But if you feel like you're in danger, then please, by all means, take care of yourself. Um, but that kind of nuance from someone like me was just never you know, you're just, you're demonized and dehumanized. It's so ridiculous. Clifton, um, I, I want to ask, and maybe you don't want to share this, but how has this affected um, your career? Because obviously what, what these career? are not the sorts of things one is supposed to say in your line of work. And there is a, a herd mentality and a sense that someone like you is a heretic with a bad odor and must be chased away or pushed out a window. Is that going on? I hope not, but I'm kind of guessing that it must be. No, John, so... My career really began to take off in 2017. Um, I found myself suddenly, um, I'm working with, uh, being shared, fought over by Tony winning directors, upstaging Tony award winning stars. I'm in workshops and readings, I'm doing TV. Like my career, like finally, it was like, things have finally taken off. Been, All this sacrifice have paid off. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very stressful, but it's like, you know, I did my first play when I was 16 and I was around 36. And I was like, finally, after 20 years, um, things are really taken off. All of the uh, the good wishes are being uh, fulfilled. And um, so everything stopped in 2020. And then 2021, I began uh, getting inquiries through my management, former management, about, uh, you know, has your client been or do they plan to get, you know, the shot or whatever. And to my manager's credit, she never, she never pushed me. She never was aggressive about it. Other actors weren't so lucky, but eventually, you know, I mean, they, they held on to the mandates, John, like Hollywood just dropped the mandates in May of last year. But even then they're like, we're just not going to say it's the reason that we're not hiring you. And the theater took an extra two months to be, to drop their vaccine mandates. And this was over a year after the CDC even acknowledged that like, there's no point 
in treating people differently who got the vaccine and who didn't. Um, it, the, the, I called it a cult. It was the Covidian cult. And when you're in the entertainment industry, you know, it's a very, it's very, very relationship heavy and reputation heavy. So no, so at a certain level, like everyone is not everyone, but most people are really, really good and they deserve to be where they are. And it's just like, what are your relationships? Who do you know? Who's going to hire you? You know, do they, do they like you? Are you likable? Yada, yada, yada. So no one is ever going to say anything that could be coded as right wing, even if it's something as simple as, well, humans are sexually dimorph sexually dimorphic species. <laughs> and, and I don't think that white people are the cause of all my problems. Like if you say any of these kinds of things, <laughs> um, you run the risk, you really run the risk of suffering from professional damage. And there's tons of cultural workers across the country who are terrified and don't say anything. And it's not that they're hard right. I mean, they might be some, it might be as simple as something as understanding economics and not being a Democrat. They, they will not, especially since Trump, I mean, Trump just completely destroyed people's mental faculties yes. and COVID made it even worse. Yes. And, you know, so now you just, you can't say anything. And so now I have no management, um, no representation. Um, I just, I presume I've been blacklisted. I still have some people here and there who reach out to me with, with certain things. I may be in New York in a couple of weeks, um, um, on something, but as far as I know, uh, I just don't have a career anymore. Um, you know, I basically am not in the, the industry and, uh, you know, and it's just, uh, I, part of the last few years has been, um, trying to get past, um, the intense amount of bitterness about it. I mean, I can't watch anything that was made or produced after 2020 wow. because I see a bunch of people who in my mind are complicit against, um, it's a bunch of people who normalized a two tiered society. And I have a huge, huge problem with that. And, um, no one has acknowledged it. No one has said this was the wrong thing to do. And that tells me that if such a thing were to happen again, they would do it all over again. They would. And, they would. you know, and, and part of my objection to all this stuff in the first place was about precedent because we can learn, we learn how to treat viruses. We learn how to evolve and we live with them and we do lose people. And it's very, very unfortunate. And we, no one wants that. At the same time, though, once you allow the state and the government to exercise this kind of power, you've now given them the green light to do it again anytime that they want. And that was a big issue for me as well. I said, you know, well, they can just say that, you know, this this year they can say that there's this bird flu going around. And so now we have to lock everything down. Yada, yada. And people say that, you know, we're not going to shut down again. They won't people won't fall for it again. But you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not so sure about that. I'm just not Especially so sure about because that. a lot of people would in a way enjoy it. That's, that's another hard aspect to it. Yeah. Well, there was the, enjoy, I, you know, there's a, um, a book I just found, um, um, politics of ponerology, which I, I can't wait to dive into. Ponerology is the study of evil. Mm. And, um, and I think one of the things that I've discovered over the past couple of years, um, particularly with regard to how we've treated children, is that uh, people, their, their empathy can be weaponized to a vicious, vicious extent. And that if people believe that they're doing, people can do all the wrong things if they think they're doing it from the right reasons. And that was, that was very eye-opening to me. And to, be, and to see people whom you've known for decades just cut you off and be unable to hear what you're saying, even if it's reasonable. <laughs> it's just, you know, um, and on top of all of that, it's just, it's, it's artists. I said, I, you know, I thought that we were the people who were advocates for, for freedom and advocates, you know, against authority. I mean, you spent four years for God's sakes talking about fascism and authoritarianism and hashtag resisting. And yet now the state comes in and dictates who you can hang out with, what you wear on your face, what you put into your body that you can and can't work. And, um, and even in New York, I mean, they're setting up checkpoints <laughs> and, and curfews and, and lines for you to inform on your neighbors. And so I, I said, you know, I mean, they, they, people don't talk about this, but they banned protesting in New York. Bill de Blasio, whom I've never met anyone who <laughs> claims to have voted for him, but Bill de Blasio <laughs> banned protests. And no one talked about it, because, but even though what sparked the ban was this LGBT activist group, they were protesting this... Um, 
makeshift church in Central Park. Um, and I think there was a medical official at, at, who actually had to speak up and say, no, you know, you might not like their beliefs, but they've helped and treated hundreds of people. They've helped take the burden off of us. But the point is that this LGBT group um, inspired this uh, protest ban. And then, of course, you know, if you were a, a BLM supporter, then you could, you know, riot then everywhere. You, but the point is, a, yeah, they made an exception. Yeah. But the point is, why did why were there no, quote unquote, liberals, quote unquote, progressives who said, no, you cannot uh, you cannot ban our right to protest. You can't do that. Like that was a big red flag at the beginning, you know, where people just didn't say anything. And it was again, it's, it's a, a, a queer rights group. You know, it, it was just it, um, I feel like I'm think, rambling, but no, I feel like I am missing in you an acknowledgement of the fact that if we're talking about 2020, 21 in particular, there were a lot of people who, as you've acknowledged, who were really scared. Like a lot of people's response to anything we've said is, but no one knew back then we were really afraid. That's and I don't bullshit. think they're, they're not lying. Sorry. Sorry. In Here's 2020? the thing. You know, and, and I, and I hate, and I hate, and I hate this line of like, you know, people say, oh, you, you're, you're working with the benefit of hindsight. There's no way we, we could have known. Yeah. But the thing is, like, like I said before, I was scared, John. I was scared the first three months. But by April, I was already like, we can't do this forever. There's other, there's other like second order problems that, were, that, 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 that are happening. At the same time, again, you had people like John Yanides, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Kuldorf, and others, doctors around the world who were saying, no, we can, we can beat this. We can treat this. We don't have to shut all this down. But they were being banned or censored or demonized. I mean, Jay Bhattacharya, he joked to me a couple of years ago. He said, you know, I, I knew things were turning around when the death threat stopped. <laughs> you know? So, so, so there's this line that's happening right now where they say, well, we just didn't know. And now we're, now we're learning the scope of the damage. Like, no, people were telling you that if you close down schools, it's going to have a... Um, negative effect on children's development and their emotional well-being which was not and now we're seeing to, to guess at the time right, right. yeah wow rocket science <laughs> and now you know now the atlantic or whatever new york Times. no offense it wants to be like <laughs> well now here we are like we can't believe i'm like no we were telling you we were telling you but you called us granny killers you called us fascists you called us eugenicists you called us white supremacists you 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 censored us from youtube and twitter and all these other outlets you didn't want to hear what we had to say and now three years later you're coming back and you're saying well we didn't know and we were scared i was scared and i figured it out why couldn't you because to knuckle under was the way that you showed that you didn't like Donald Trump. <laughs> and now here we are. And that's <laughs> you know, the most incredible thing, John, that I saw was we have prominent Democrats from America's mayor, uh, America's governor, a.k.a. Andrew Disgraced. I like titties Cuomo um, <laughs> to our current president, <laughs> our current president and vice president who are all saying, I'm not taking any vaccine um, from the Trump administration. Is it safe? You know, has it been has it been tested? Yada, yada, yada. And then as soon as power changes hands, you got to take this or you can't you can't or you're a second class citizen. And I was like that, you know, that makes no sense. So the, the vaccine is dangerous when Trump is administering it. And if you want to get out of this pandemic, shouldn't you be thanking Trump? I mean, his, he has supporters now who don't want to vote for him because he keeps talking about, you know, I I developed the vaccine and yada, you know, I mean, he, he, he's a narcissist. You know, he's always like bragging on himself and selling. He's a salesman. He's always like, this is what I did. So shouldn't you be praising him? But no, they were saying this is dangerous. And then Biden gets in the office and it's like, no, now take this. And so I'm like, dude, there's nothing scientific about this. There's nothing. It's, it's political. It's, it's a moral panic. Uh, you know, I don't want to reduce it to that because obviously there was a real danger. But at the same time, um, it was just, it was, I mean, the fact that they got people at 7 p.m. every day to clap for people they don't know. And I said, this is, this is really cult-like and weird. I know oh, why you're doing it. That. Oh, come on. No, that was dude. great. I, dude, thought, come on. I love that. I used to get my I, girls and we would make noise out the window. And we were at the epicenter. You know, we're, we're in Jackson Heights. And so we're listening to sirens all day. You even thought that was an act, that that was phony? It was, it was weird, dude. Like, like, dude, send send the people in your in your family like a card, like tell them like you appreciate them. But but the fact that we're all going to get together and just, you know, and, and applaud and the workers every day, every day, oh, every I, day at 7 p.m. I, I found that to be a, a bit a bit, uh, with the a lockdown, bit ritualistic it was, and strange. It was, a bond, it was a bonding experience. And I was thankful to the to health workers because we both agree a lot of people were dying. And yeah, yeah, you really you you. 
you are better at approaching that whole thing with pure logic than I am. The entire that entire couple of years, because well, I don't, I don't think it was pure logic. I mean, I think a part of it was just um, instinct as well, and being kind of weirded out. And I think it co- kind of ties back into the um, into Thomas Sowell of you know at the end of his memoir, he talks about how the souls um, all kind of march to the beat of their own drum. There's this great anecdote where um, uh, a brother of his, I think, is trying to figure out like who was at some family gathering is trying to figure out like who is which one was his nephew. And there was a kid playing by himself. And he was like, I knew that was your nephew. Um, <laughs> the souls are always off doing their <laughs> own thing. And um, maybe that's what attracted me to people like him, because, you know, he's someone who just they march to the beat of their own drum and Very they will much. take stands with which are not popular, but. To them, at least, uh, you know, mm-hmm. this is this is the way. But I think to me, it was just, you know, I've been a lone wolf and a loner in, in many ways, um, uh, in many aspects of my life. And this, the whole, the clapping ritual, I think for me was another aspect of, I feel like I'm watching people. Um, I mean, part of it, maybe I'm just being contrarian for, for contrary sake. Li- you are on this a little bit, I think. A little bit. That's That's fair. But it, I was, I, I just thought it was so weird, man. It was just so weird and eerie. And um, like know, it's, you, it's one thing to want to celebrate people who are, who are, you know, doing, who are doing the work. But mm-hmm. the way that it, that it was expressed, I thought was just, I just thought it was very bizarre. I said, this is so, this is weird, bro. I'm not, I'm not doing this. You know, I, I get you on the whole lone wolf thing. There was a lunch in Palo Alto in 2001. And at that lunch were Thomas Sowell, Shelby Steele, Walter Williams, Larry Elder, and me, for the record. I was the new kid on the block. And the thing that I noticed, it was a very strong current in that room. The idea was we were going to keep on having these meetings. And I thought this is never going to happen again because all of us are very friendly. We're happy to see each other. But we're all loners in that sense. We're all people who sit and write in a corner. We're not joiners. And so this is not going to become a thing. And, and it didn't. And, you know, there was no bad blood, but I knew I better think of this as a historical moment because it will never happen again. You seem to be of that, of that stripe. And it means you can think for yourself, but it does mean that you're going to have herds and herds of people despising you. And one has to learn how to handle it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, too, because as an actor, I mean, one of the worst things is, uh, you know, we want, we want to be liked. I mean, there's that classic yeah. line in Chicago, right? Yeah. Of, uh, of, you know, we're all here because our mothers didn't hug us enough. Yeah. And, um, and so that, and I think what people don't understand about artists in the space that I find myself in now is that our skin is still pretty thin. My skin is still pretty thin. I mean, that's why mm. I became an actor is because, you know, I'm, I'm a sensitive guy. And um, it's not fun to uh, have this abuse heaped on you and, and to be slandered in, in, in this way. But at the same time, I think... One of the good things that's come out of the past few years has been finding my spine and just being like, this is not okay. I'm going to say what I believe. And I think this is true. And I don't give a damn if you like it or not. Um, but and you have to really not give a damn. Is the thing. You, you have to. And I, I, mean, I, and I still do, but I have to, you know, <laughs> train myself not to. But, but what's hard about it is that, and again, this is another one of these lessons I've learned from people that you mentioned over the last few years is that. Most people just, they want to be comfortable and they, they want to, they want to cling to safety and their comfort, um, the comfort of their lives. I mean, you know, when you talk the comfort about- comfort of group membership, most people group, need that. Yeah. Right. Belonging, validation, these kinds of things, acceptance. Um, and because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a loner, I, I have different, I think I have less pressures in some way than others do, but, or obligations. But um, what- one thing that I've I've been very disheartened by, and this comes from, you know, and maybe you found this too in your private conversations. People, when you when you get them one on one, and it's sure it's selection bias, you know, our own circle, they're far more sensible. But then, um, on a group level, it's like, you know, we're still going to wear these masks. You know, we're still shutting down and closing schools, but we're not, we're just going to kind of go kind of go. If you're along somebody like us, you're constantly. You're constantly confronted with that, that you have one-on-one conversations where a person says that they largely agree with you or at least halfway agree with you, but they're never going to show that in public. That's, and so you realize there's a rot underneath the externals. Yes, that's, that's just right. the way it is. And, and to me, you know, and, I, and I, could, I could be accused definitely of going down like 
conspiracy rabbit holes um, for 2020, 2021, because it was just so confusing and like who knew who knew what happened. And I'm, I, I own up to that. Um, but at the end of the day, I said, you know what, especially thinking as an actor, you don't need to have any kind of grand conspiracy theory to explain what's going on. All you have to do is look at human motivation and how people behave. If you're in an institution where someone like an Anthony Fauci is controlling your funding, are you going to say anything um, no. uh, untoward about him if he's controlling your money? Of course not. You're going to look the other way. You know, and if you say anything, then what, what might happen to you? You can lose your job. There, there goes your mortgage. There goes your marriage. There goes your kids to college. You know, so there's all these kinds of things in place where you don't need some kind of grand scheme. No, it's people behaving the way that they do. And that's why we, you know, they, they turn a, a blind eye to corruption, to wrongdoing. They don't say anything because it's and easier it's also, to not say yeah, anything, especially. And even it doesn't always have to be about salary and position, just social opprobrium. Being mm -hmm. jumped and called a name makes most people cry or at least cry inside. It hurts. And you only go around once. Most people would just rather have a bit of mendacity because that makes it easier. They have groceries to buy. They want to watch Succession. And that's what right. that's most people. And then there's some sick people like Glenn and me and apparently you where you are able to tolerate being called these names because you know that you're goddamn right. But that is not John, a normal condition. That's the thing. I, you know. I've been, there's been times where I've literally been in tears because I said, I wish that I were different. Like, you know, at Williamstown, I was like, why is no one saying anything about this? Yeah. This is so bizarre to me. Um, you know, but I realized that most people just won't say anything. And for me, like I left Facebook many years ago and I'm only on it now so I can have an Instagram account. And even then I check, check, I check both very rarely, occasionally. Um, but I just got tired of, of, um, of arguing with people on Facebook. And, um, and so I left, but I found that, you know, I just, I, I can't, I physically am unable to shut up about these kinds of things. If I see something wrong, um, I, I have to, I have to say it. I don't know, like my, I think about it, like my life could have been so much, I could be in movies and on Broadway right now. There's no reason I shouldn't, I couldn't be there right now. Um, but you know, I opened my damn fool mouth and, um, you know, I could be, you could have been in Joe popular. Turner's come and gone. You could have, you could have been in that. You could. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're doing Othello on Broadway. They're doing Romeo and Juliet. I mean, you know, Michael Cassio, Mercutio. I mean, there's all kinds of things. And I, I try not to, you know, a friend sent me the other day, a cast, like, like I, said, I guess they're doing our town. And I just said, stop sending me this because I, it just makes me angry. And I was going to say, you could, be, you could be in anything these days because casting has opened up so much. It's not the August Wilson. There are all sorts of plays that you should be in right now. Well, you know, but then it's, it's I just don't want to like, it's tough for me because, I mean, A, I don't even have reps anymore. So, I mean, how am I going to get into any of that? But then I have to work with people who I know wouldn't piss on me if I were on fire. And not because, you know, I'm walking around, you know, talking about make America great again. Um, it's simply because, yeah, it's, it's because I consider myself to be actually a liberal and these people are not. Um, and they wanted me to be a second class citizen for two years and they're not acknowledging it. And I also, I mean, this is a whole other podcast because I just feel like, you know, there's so much mismanagement and so much, um, ideological capture that's part of the problem as well um so what kind of industry would i be re-entering into you know what i mean like i i've always had a problem just because i just i never had any desire to be an activist you know what i mean like when i was on broadway and i was doing the play that goes wrong you know i'd already auditioned for hamilton a million times they all know who i am um you know, is he Aaron Burr? Is he Washington? Is he George uh, Mulligan? Who is this motherfucker? Um, <laughs> but the fact that I was able to do this beloved British comedy, um, uh, you know, was a great challenge for me. And the thing is, I've been like the one black person or first black person in, in a lot of things. And I never asked for any recognition because I was just acting. And, you know, I didn't know what else I was going to do with my life. And I kept getting hired. And when I really began applying myself, my income increased uh, by uh, quite a great deal. So, like, 
why, you know, and that, that was, and I was completely fine with that. If I could do Shakespeare and musicals the rest of my life, I would be happy. I don't need to change the world or to, or to engineer society in any kind of way. Um, all I want to do is work, but it feels like if you want to work now, um, you have to take a stand on something, especially if you're black. And I'm like, no, you know what? My stand, my reparations is doing Shakespeare and, and Greek plays, you know, because I never would have done them before. And I will add this one thing as well, like the, the, the recent controversy over Romeo and Juliet, the Tom Holland, Romeo and Juliet, and this poor, poor uh, woman who has been uh, vilified. People are saying, there was one viral tweet that said, you know, R&J in 1994, and it was like the DiCaprio and Claire Danes. And then it's like R&J in 2024, and it's Tom Holland's black girl. And I'm like, guys, colorblind casting has been standard in the theater for decades. And 10 years ago, nobody would have cared about this casting choice at all. And yet now, because people are so sensitive to these lazy race swaps, and they're not creative choices, they're political choices that, that are being made. And that's what people are, react, are, are reacting against. But now people just assume that if there's a black person in this role now, that they're there for political reasons and for cynical reasons, not because they deserve to be there. And I literally, I mean, I saw black conservatives saying it's absurd to cast black folks in Shakespeare. I'm like, really? So that means that James Earl Jones and, uh, and Avery Brooks and, you know, uh, uh, I mean, can, can you imagine, like, you know, Angela well, Bassett make an as Lady Macbeth? But then uh, we should play no other role, basically. I mean, you know, I mean, Andre Bauer play, played Iago in D.C. to Patrick Stewart's Othello, you know, <laughs> I mean, so... You know, I mean, could you imagine Viola Davis doing some Greek tragedy? Are you kidding me? She would, she would be unbelievable she would as, as Medea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's like the James Earl Jones of her generation, in my opinion. She has she so is. much power and force on stage. She's yep. unbelievable. And you're telling me now that she doesn't deserve to be. In, I mean, it's it's gotten so crazy now. People are actually their, their backlash now is that black folks shouldn't be doing these things that they've been doing. It's just it's. But it's a backlash to, um, in my opinion, left-wing extremism. And, um, you know, you are quite shame. right. Clifton, we're going to pick this up again because we have reached <laughs> the end of our time. On that uplifting note, um, I want to thank you very much for coming on to Glenn's show, especially when he's not here. And you have given me a lot to think about, most of it unpleasant. And I must admit, there's a part of me that enjoys that. And so thank you for sharing, sharing your journey. And um, I really, I, I, I wish you the best in everything that you're doing, but in particular with this soul play, which hopefully will earn you a Tony when it comes to Broadway. <laughs> that would be the greatest karmic retribution ever. But uh, John, it's been a pleasure. I hope Glenn is okay. And next time we got to talk about uh, Sondheim and show tunes and turn off, oh, <laughs> turn, right. off your, uh, turn off your straight audience. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely need to do that. That's right. Oh <laughs> uh, Yeah, let's do it. I'm there. All right. You'll hear from me. Awesome. Thanks, Clifton. 